Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Andre. I work for Collabora, and in this talk, I'm going to tell you about Pristine LFS, a replacement for Pristine Tar. I've mentioned this a couple of times in our previous talks already, but I've received some questions about this tool, so I decided to dedicate a whole talk to it. So I'd like to start with a little bit of history to explain why this tool is needed. Uh, at Collabora, we develop a Debian derivative called Apertis. It's built for embedded usage. It was originally based on Ubuntu and bits and pieces of Debian, and now a custom software and frameworks. In 2018, it had about 2,000 packages, source packages, which we built in open build service for MD64, MD, ARM64, and ARMHF. We originally only used Git or Git-based workflows for select packages only, mostly packages we developed ourselves or packages like systemd and the kernel. Basically, packages where we did some significant development and um, we wanted to keep changes tracked in Git. For the rest of the packages, they were stored in open build service using its built-in version and system. In 2019 came the big change. We decided to move to Debian to stop being a derivative of a derivative. Um, this made the maintenance easier. It also allowed us to review and reduce the delta. We had to both Ubuntu and Debian because it was spread across all packages we had. It was quite difficult to track it all down. We also decided to import all packages into Git and make it the primary source generating source packages directly from it. We also moved away from SIGIT, a very primitive web interface for Git and Fabricator, which we use for code reviews, to GitLab. This made it possible to enable CI for all packages. For those who don't know what CI is, continuous integration. So we were able to enable it for all packages in Apertis. Before that, we only used Jenkins for those packages we already had in Git. And we also used Lava, which ran integration tests on complete operating system images. Now with GitLab CI, we, we are able to enable CI on each and every package we have. We mostly use it though for testing the packages actually can be built and um, also for license compliance purposes. So, um, open build service, which I mentioned previously, it was originally developed by OpenSUSE. It was called OpenSUSE Build Service. Uh, it's a web service which combines package building infrastructure, a bit like as built in Debian, with a GitHub sort of like web UI for project management and some review tools. So, users can fork packages, change them whatever way they like, build them without affecting the main distribution and then submit the changes for review where they can be merged or rejected if they are not of good quality enough. However, the uh, review tools in OBS, they work best with RPMs or RPM-based workflows where um, the source package is composed or consists of a tarball, a text, spec file and possibly a bunch of patches next to them, all uncompressed. In Debian source packages, uh, we have a tarball in which there's the Debian packaging and the upstream tarball, or maybe many of them. And um, OBS cannot look inside of those Debian tarballs. Sometimes it can, but not always. Uh, so during the reviews, it basically ignores the content. It shows that, well, this tarball was removed, this was added, and that's it mostly. So it's not very useful for reviews, or it's not, the history tracking is not very good in it either. So when something was changed in the past, we probably are able to find the revision which introduced the change, but it's difficult to tell what exactly the change was because it's mostly not shown. Um, branches in OBS are implemented in a way a bit like in Subversion. So um, when a user creates a new branch, it basically creates a new project linking to 
another project or a new package link into another package, the original one. And the first entry in the history is, oh, this package has been branched. So if the original package or project was removed, it's not possible to see in the past and, and uh, see the, the history of the package anymore. So on those screenshots, you can see uh, a typical example of a package which, which has the history which begins with branching. On the right, there's a typical diff OBS shows for packages. In this case, as you can see, it was able to look inside of the uh, Debian package interval, but only because the version of the package didn't change. So it was able to, to tell that this package indeed has some changes inside. But if we change the revision, the name of the table would change as well. So OBS would completely ignore it and just show that, oh, there's a new table. So it's quite suboptimal as you can see, and moving to Git was a huge benefit for us. So uh, we started doing initial tests of importing everything into Git. We decided to use the 14 branching scheme, which was proposed by Rafael Herzog um, six years ago now. It was revised twice since then. It builds on basically git build package workflow, adding namespaces for multiple upstream releases, Debian releases, derivatives, and so on. Um, we decided initially to store tables using pristine tar. Um, why this is useful? Um, we want uh, some guarantees that the table is actually coming from the upstream, hasn't been modified in between. So storing tables is good for reproducibility, for uh, paper trail basically. And it's also useful to tell that we do or don't have any changes compared to the same packages from Debian. So in this grand scheme, OBS would just build packages and everything else would be in Git. So this is how Deb14 looks like more or less in Debian. Uh, there's the branch for upstream sources, a branch for the upstream sources combined with Debian packaging. Each upstream release gets uh, its own tag. Um, the same goes for Debian package releases. Um, this is the aperture version of Deb14. Uh, you get uh, an, another branch for each release. In this case, it's a pre-release of 2019. Each uh, package version in Aperture gets its own tag with our own suffix added sometimes. So when we don't have any changes, we just reuse the Debian uh, package version. If we have some local changes we need to apply, we add uh, another incremental number. So um, we started hitting huge problems with Presenta during the initial import. Uh, sometimes uh, Presenta would fail to import the upstream table. As you can see, in this case, it's exact utils, which is itself an exact table. Um, in other cases, it, it would fail to reproduce the table, or it would sometimes reproduce it with a different checksum. In this case, it fails altogether, as you can see, it, it would print lots of errors and fail uh, ultimately. So after fighting with this for quite some time, we decided it's not a very good idea to continue and we need to somehow replace pristine tar. So why those things happen? First of all, pristine tar needs to be able to you reproduce the output of every tar version ever used for tar balls for packages in Debian. Uh, these days, there are not many formats of tar. In the past, there were different historical versions of, of the formats. It's already not a very trivial uh, task to support all of this format, but probably doable to some extent. Compressors are worse because, uh, unlike tar versions, they've changed, it seems, a bit more. 
so it has to be able to reproduce the output of every compressor ever used for tower balls. And this battle is never-ending, uphill battle I'd say, because compressors change all the time and sometimes they, the output changes between versions and it's very difficult. So how does Pristinta achieve this? It ships a old SUSE version of Zip2, it ships another different outdated version of the same compressor, and it also ships a Zlib based GZIP, which is heavily based on NetBSD's GZIP. All of this is combined into something the upstream calls the Frankenstein compressor. It's not something you are supposed to use ever in your life, probably, unless you are a Pristinta developer. So, Pristinta is is a magical tool which I'm surprised works. It's not 100% bulletproof and it can never be because, because this is ultimately an unachievable goal. It, you can only achieve it to some degree, but as things change, you need to update Pristinta all the time and not break what it previously done. And Exet makes things only worse because um, People complained about this quite a lot. Uh, actually, Exet sometimes even the same build of Exet can produce a different bit stream for a given input. So we decided to use GitLFS instead of Pristinta. Um, so it has the benefit that it stores binaries as is. There's no need to fight with all the new compressors. It supports, it is supported by GitLab, which, for example, we use in Debian for Salsa. And the protocol is quite simple and can be easily re-implemented if for some reason the implementation we have is not suitable. Uh, so GitLFS uh, works by storing binaries in a separate binary storage next to a Git repository both in on the server, which is in the case of GitLab, and locally. So it creates um, uh, an object storage inside of the Git repository where the files are put and then they upload to the server. So we decided to name the tool Pristine LFS to make it sound familiar to Pristine Tar. Instead of Perl, it's written in Python, mostly because I knew Python. <laughs> Um, it uses uh, the implementation of Git LFS from Git LFS upstream, so the Go implementation. It's mostly compatible in terms of options with Pristine Tar, so you can start using it very easily. There are some differences, but uh, they are mostly irrelevant for most workflows. And we've been testing it for two years in production. So, um, how Pristine LFS stores tarballs? So, when you import a tarball, it creates uh, a special file. GitLFS basically creates a special file in your repository. A text file mentioning the hash sum of your file, the size, and the version of the protocol. In GitLFS terminology, it's called a pointer file. So basically, it tells uh, GitLFS that the actual file is stored elsewhere, and this is the hash of it. Um, as you can see, there are Git attributes in here. So GitLFS uses Git attributes to make sure that the users don't have to do extra actions to actually work with files. So it installs um, a special hook, which on checkout, copies or hard links, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but it basically makes the file available in a working directory. It replaces the pointer file, which is actually stored in, in your Git history. When you have edited the file, for example, it and you committed it, it recreates the binary object instead inside of the Git LFS object storage, inside of the Git uh, directory. And when you push, it talks to the server, figures out that, oh, there's a new object, and it sends it. And the same way, if you clone a new repository and you don't have all necessary objects, you just have a plain git history, 
and you want to check it out, it realizes that, that this object is not locally available. It talks to the server, downloads the object, and then proceeds as usual. So this is more or less the mechanism of how Git LFS works. So Pristine LFS uses this mechanism. It creates the Git attributes file just for tables. Um, it also allows storing signatures for tables. They are not using the Git LFS mechanism. They are just stored in Git. Uh, as you can see, there's a um, merge setting for binaries. So if without this setting, um, Git would try to diff binary signatures, which is pointless and uh, a bit inconvenient. So this is a more sane default to avoid diffing them. Um, Pristine LFS doesn't use the Git LFS hooks by default. Uh, in fact, it uh, does the necessary manipulations with the object itself. So it commits to the Pristine LFS branch manually. Um, this is to avoid downloading extra tables which you don't need. If you only need to import a, a table, you don't need to download all of the tables you ever imported. And this is exactly what Git LFS would do by default. So um, the Git hook would only work and download all tables if you actually try to check out the Pristine LFS branch, which you don't normally need to. So as I mentioned, um, Pristinta is mostly compatible with Pristine LFS or actually the other way around. So um, Pristinta has some subcommands for um, tarball specifically stored in its Delta protocol, which we don't need. So those commands are not included. There's also there was also a verify step command which we also don't need because um, there's no tarball recreation. Um, tarballs are being addressed in Git LFS by the checksum, so it's guaranteed that the checksum of the table will match the checksum of the table stored on Pristine LFS branch, so the verify command is not needed. There's a new command, uh, import DSC, which is uh, just a convenience tool uh, to automatically import all tables mentioned in a DSC file, just to make the life easier to save your commands and all that. So, Pristine LFS is a little bit easier to use than Pristine Tar uh, because uh, we've added some options to simplify the usage. For example, the author option for checkout subcommand automatically finds the version which you need to check out by inspecting the Debian change log available on the current branch. So, you don't actually need to list the tables and check out one specific table version you need. So you just go onto the branch with your packaging, in this case it's Apertis 2020 Dev 1, and you tell it to automatically check out the latest one, which it does. Um, so this is how import DSC works. You can just give it a DSC file and it sees that there's a table and it imports it automatically. You can also import the whole source package if you want. So if, if you pass the pool option, it also imports the Debian packaging table and also the DSC file itself. And probably any signatures if you have on it, on the table, I mean. So this is useful uh, for a specific workflow we have in Apertis. We want source packages to be consistent across releases. And by consistent, I mean uh, having identical checksums. So we have a uh, shared pool of packages between releases. So we obviously want to re re reuse the tables between different releases. We want them to all be the same, have the same checksum. We want to deduplicate the pool, obviously. Um, but if we rebuild whole packages from scratch each time, the checksums of the uh, tables may change, the Debian table most importantly. 
while this doesn't happen often, it sometimes does happen, and then packages fail to propagate to repositories, and we need to manually copy them from other releases. So we've created a special machinery to prevent this from happening and to ensure that source packages are the same everywhere. I'll explain how this works. So this is uh, how uh, branches look in a typical Apertis package. So the, there are the standard deposing branches we have for upstream packages or upstream source, Debian source and Apertis source. And there's also an extra branch for pristine LFS information, which has the pointer files referring to the tables stored somewhere in the object storage of GitLab. The CI machinery takes that source of the Apertis branch, um, downloads the tarball from the LFS storage using pristine LFS, builds the source package and uploads it all to OBS, where it gets built for all architectures we support in Apertis. When the upload has completed, it takes the uh, generated tarballs and commits them all to a new pristine LFS source branch in the repository for the package and pushes the branch, uploading all of the objects with it. So the next time uh, the package is uploaded to a different release of Apertis, it's not completely rebuilt from scratch, but instead the Debian source package is checked out directly from the uh, pristine LFS source branch and uploaded to OBS. We could have done it differently, obviously. We could have gone to OBS and could have copied uh, the package directly at the OBS level, or we could probably store all packages we've ever generated somewhere else. But this is the easiest way, uh, the simplest way we, we came up with, and it works, and it's easy to support within Pristine LFS itself. So I've been using Pristine LFS in Debian for some time already for my packages. And I tried to also use it for some team maintained packages, but there was a little bit of backlash because people are not familiar with it and uh, Pristine Tar usually works. But I, um, I would love to see Pristine LFS used more widely in Debian because it ha uh, has certain benefits over Pristine Tar. It's more reliable, more robust. It, does require server support for GitLFS, but since we use uh, GitLab for Salsa, we get it for free. It doesn't work fully offline like Pristinta because it doesn't have all information on Git branches. If you need to check out some table, you need to download the corresponding binary object first into the local object storage. So before going on the plane, you need to synchronize the object storage and then you can work with the tarballs uh, you don't need to do that obviously with Presenta. you just need to have the necessary branches because it will recreate the tarball unless it doesn't and the checksum is different obviously at the moment there's still no git build package and integration yet um it is quite simple to create i guess because uh in any case, Pristine LFS is mostly option compatible with Pristine Tar, so we can just copy paste necessary lines, but there's an easier, easier and better way. Uh, Pristine LFS is written in Python, so its functions can be used directly from Git build packet, which is also in Python. Um, so um, feel free to install Pristine LFS and play with it. Uh, the code is up on Salsa. Uh, so you can hack on it if you like. Um, I'm planning a release next week, I guess, uh, with a couple of uh, fixes and usability improvements. And I'd love to uh, hear your feedback. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd just like to know that we are hiring and we, as you can see on this slide, we love Debian and we use it a lot in Collabora. And that's it. 
I'd love to answer your questions after the talk. Thank you.